Well, the Orioles and Cardinals started a baseball game on Tuesday night, but because of some weather in St. Louis, they were not able to finish it. I'll get you everything you need to know from the suspended game in the sixth inning, what it means for how they'll finish this series on Wednesday, and a little look at the Orioles' offensive approach. Is it a problem or is it a solution this year? That's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, May 22nd, 2024. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to recap the part of the baseball game that we got Tuesday night in St. Louis. Five and a half innings were played. The game was tied at one. The rain came down and the game was suspended. I'll still get you the five things you need to know from the five and a half innings that were played and give you an update on what the schedule will look like Wednesday as the O's and Cardinals will finish the Tuesday night game and then complete the series with another game as well. And then finally, we'll take a look at the offensive approach for the Orioles this season. It's been a large topic of conversation. The O's are walking less. The on-base percentage is down, but they're being more aggressive. The power is up, and they've still been one of the best offenses in baseball. So I'm going to dive a little deeper into what the new approach is and what it means for the Orioles, and is it as bad as some people are making it out to be? But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by eBay Motors. From brakes to exhaust kits and beyond, eBay Motors has over 122 million parts to keep your ride or die alive. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to bring home that big win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. So we'll start today with everything we saw from the partial baseball game on Tuesday night. The situation right now, it is a 1-1 game heading into the bottom of the sixth inning at Bush Stadium in St. Louis between the Orioles and the Cardinals before we went into a rain delay for some crazy storms. It looked like the weather was kind of slowing up at one point, but they then decided to suspend the game and it will be completed on Wednesday here before they then do play another full nine-inning game to finish up the series. But I still want to get you the five things you need to know from what we saw so far in a 1-1 game in the sixth inning between the Orioles and the Cardinals. So the first thing you need to know is Kyle Bradish looked much, much better in this, his fourth start back from the injured list for the Orioles. Bradish in this one, five innings of one run ball, four hits, six Ks, one walk, 74 pitches, just three hard hit balls against him. and has a 2.41 ERA in the four starts since returning now his last start which came last wednesday against the blue jays he only lasted four innings he only gave up two runs but he was really errant the pitches were everywhere he threw 85 pitches which is why he came out after only four they were high stress pitches he just didn't look right i was concerned after that one but he comes back out there on tuesday and he was attacking hitters like the kyle bradish we know and love and quite frankly kind of a bad break for the Orioles for the rain to come then. We'll get to that in a moment. But for when he was out there, he was really, really good. And it was the Bradish we know. It was slider as the number one pitch. 24 of his 74 pitches were sliders. That was his most used. He got five whiffs on that thing. His number two pitch was the curveball. 20 of those got some whiffs. Then comes the sinker and the four-seamer, and he tossed in one changeup on Tuesday night, but he was attacking the strike zone, zone percentage up over 50%, almost 60%, which is with his slider, which was really, really good. He threw a slider at 91. I mean, that was better slider velocity than we've seen. In fact, the velo was up on all of Bradish's pitches compared to what we've seen all this year. The sinker had good movement. The slider had good movement. The curveball, he was dotting it wherever he wanted to all night long. Really, really impressed by what we saw from Bradish. I mean, he was inches away from being five scoreless. The only run was scored on a Nolan Gorman RBI double in the second where it was a tough play for Cedric Mullins. But the ball hit off his glove before he ran into the wall and center field. It popped out, allowing that one Cardinal run to score. Bradish easily could have been through five scoreless in this game. Very breaking ball heavy approach, but that command was just pristine. Fastball up to 97, slider up to 91. Really, really liked what I saw from Kyle Bradish. 
But the second thing you need to know is, unfortunately, with Bradish pitching that well, the rain's coming at the wrong time. Lance Lynn was able to get in a sixth inning of work in the top of the sixth, shutting down the Orioles. Bradish was actually walking back out to the mound to start warming up for the bottom of the sixth, and that is when the Cardinals grounds crew ran out there and started covering the field with the tarp. And even if they had continued the game Tuesday night, the rain delay was long enough where Bradish would not have been able to come back into that game. The Orioles would have gone to the bullpen. So at that point, it's honestly a better thing that it got suspended because, you know, the O's only got four innings from Dean Kramer on Monday night. They don't have a lot of off days coming up. So that is nice to at least have a full off day for the bullpen on Tuesday. But he was pretty efficient, Bradish was. I mean, 74 pitches only to get through five innings after, again, it took him 85 to get through four in his last start. I mean, if he was continuing to cruise along, he was easily going to get through six and had a chance to pitch into the seventh inning in this game, which, again, would have been something helpful for the Oriole bullpen and would have been good to see for Bradish. Unfortunately, you can't control the weather, and uh, that is what happened, but still five strong from the Oriole right-hander. Third thing you need to know from what we saw so far in that game on Tuesday night is that Kyle Stowers was really trying to do it all himself for the Orioles. Got his second start, I believe, maybe third start, in the Orioles lineup since he was recalled, replacing Heston Kerstad on the roster last week. And uh, he had the Orioles' first hit, a leadoff double in the third off of Lance Lynn. And it was his first extra base hit of the season, kind of roped one into the right field corner, just his, his second hit of the year. He really hasn't been here for that long, but he hit it 109.7 miles per hour off the bat, just crushed it to right field. And on the broadcast, you didn't really see him do the sprinkler. Now, some people have said that, that he did do it at second base. And then Stowers also reached base in the fifth inning, which we'll get to, and he reached second base. But he, I didn't see him do the sprinkler, and I kind of thought, hey, that's odd. You know, you always see the guys do the sprinkler. But then I realized Kyle Stowers has never gotten to do the sprinkler. So even if he did do it Tuesday night, that was the first time ever. Because if you remember, Stowers made the Orioles opening day roster last season, and kind of very early in the year, they started to implement the sprinkler. But he struggled last year. He went two for 30, and both of those hits were singles. So he never got an extra base hit. He was then sent down in May and did not return to the Orioles' big league ball club last year. So just literally never got a chance to do the sprinkler until Tuesday, which is just funny to think about. Like, he's been around these guys, but didn't get the chance to do it and probably wasn't uh, atop his mind when he hit that double. But crushed that thing in the third. Unfortunately, the Orioles weren't able to get him home. But then he came up with two outs and nobody on in the fifth, and the Orioles trailing one nothing, And he hit a ball to second base that I wouldn't call, like, a routine grounder. Like, he got a little bit on it. He hit it 91 miles an hour. It was kind of a tough play. But it completely ate up Nolan Gorman, who let it get by him for an error. And shout out to Stowers. I mean, most hitters just cruise into first base. They're like, all right, I'm on. He saw Gorman get a glove on it. It kind of slowed it down for the right fielder, Dylan Carlson. And Stowers took on, kind of caught Carlson napping a little bit and slid into second base safely. And taking that extra base was a huge play on that error. And just shout out to Kyle Stowers, who hit the ball pretty well twice and thought he put a good right field. Like he didn't have to make any insane plays, but there were two different cases in this game when the Cardinals, with a runner on first, hit a double to right field. And the ball, luckily for the Orioles, kind of ricocheted off the wall that juts out in foul territory. And both times, Stowers, who got the start in right field on Tuesday night, played the ball perfectly off that wall, picked it up, made a strong throw into the cutoff man, and held that runner that was at first at third base both times. Those were both with two outs. And each time, instead of a run scoring, it made it second and third with two outs. And each time, Bradish got the next batter out to get out of the inning and put up a zero. It was a huge play both times by Stowers, something that might kind of go under the radar. But I liked what I saw from Kyle Stowers in the game so far on Tuesday night. And then the fourth thing you need to know from what's gone on in this game so far is that Jorge Mateo, right after Stowers reached on that error in the fifth, tied the game at one, driving in the only Oriole run so far with an incredible at-bat against Lance Lynn. And Mateo had come up in the third with Stowers on second, nobody out. He tried to get a bunt down, couldn't get it down, ripped a ball foul that eventually ended up striking out. The Orioles didn't get a run in that inning, but he comes up in another spot, Stowers on second, two down, down one nothing in the fifth, and he was just locked in in that at-bat against Lynn. 1-0 fastball out over the plate. He rips it down the right field line. Unfortunately, just barely landed foul. Then he got a hanging breaking ball on 2-1 and one and ripped it foul down the left field line and put a good swing on it. Spit on a couple of pitches out of the zone. Fouled off a couple of tough high fastballs from Lance Lynn. Got a 3-2 pitch in the middle of the zone and just uncorked one 
into left field. It was kind of a hanging cutter down the middle. Mateo rips it into left for an RBI double, scoring Stowers and tying the game at one. 107.7 miles per hour off the bat for Mateo. It was his second hardest hit ball of the season. The only ball he hit harder was at 108.5, I believe, and that was that go-ahead crazy hit in the 12th inning of that wild game in D.C. against the Nationals that the Orioles ended up winning in 12, where Mateo hit the RBI single, then advanced a second on an errant throw, then advanced a third on an errant throw and scored a run on a wild pitch when he was just tormenting the Nats on the base paths in that game. So both of his hard hit balls or his super hard hit balls have been pretty clutch so far this year. Listen, he's playing a good defense at second. He's ripping the ball at the plate, just continuing to like what I'm seeing from Jorge Mateo. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' currently suspended game, one-to-one in the bottom of the sixth against the Cardinals from Tuesday night, is that otherwise, not really much from the Orioles' offense. Mateo and Stowers, yeah, those two, the only hits. The Orioles have yet to draw a walk. Colton Kowser was hit by a pitch in this game, luckily did stay in. Gunnar Henderson should have drawn a walk to lead off the game. 3-1 pitch that he took was clearly low, was called a strike, and then he ended up striking out. But otherwise... Not a lot going on from the O's offense. Six hard hit balls total. Gunner does have two of them, but he's over three with a strikeout. And uh, yeah, they, I mean, they've been getting pitches over the plate. Lance Lynn throwing a lot of strikes as usual from the veteran righty. Orioles been done a pretty good job of attacking pitches down the middle, just kind of rolling them over, not getting solid content in this game. And yeah, it is what it is. But I guess the question after that is. Okay, this is a product a little bit of the Orioles' more aggressive approach. Is it an issue? A lot of people are thinking it is. I'm not so sure that this is an aggressive approach from the Orioles is an issue. So coming up next, we'll kind of break down what the approach change has been from the O's this year and how it will impact them, not just right now, but moving forward in this 2024 season. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks, certainly the most enjoyable way right now to play daily fantasy sports. You don't want to miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your Prize Picks entries, whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs. Just take your pick of more or less and add them to your Prize Picks entry today. That's all you got to do. They give you a stat for a player in a game. You just pick more or less, and they have it for the NBA playoffs as well. You can win up to 100 times your money. But back to Major League Baseball, you know, if you're looking at the Orioles full game that they're playing today, eh, maybe the O's, you look at Kyle Gibson's strikeout number and you say the O's know Gibson pretty well. Don't think they're going to strike out a lot with him and you go less on that number. You can do it all at prize picks and it's super easy to play. You get the entries in in like 60 seconds or less. Doesn't take up a lot of time in your day as well. So download the app today and use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the prize picks app today, use code locked on MLB and get a first deposit match up to $100 at prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So as the Orioles, at least so far in the game Tuesday night, kind of struggling offensively, didn't have a lot going in the loss to the Cardinals on Monday night. It's been a large topic of conversation among Orioles fans over the last couple of weeks is kind of the new offensive approach for the O's here in 2024. Quite frankly, they've just been more aggressive at the plate. And the big thing that's come up is their walk rate and their on-base percentage. The Orioles coming into play on Tuesday had just a 7% walk rate as a team. That was 28th in Major League Baseball. You don't want to be 28th in a lot of offensive categories in the league. And their 303 on base percentage total, while a little better because they're hitting, that's still only 23rd in Major League Baseball. This is a team that got on base at a good clip last year with a lot of guys who have a patient approach. And it's the Orioles who preach swing decisions, preach you know drawing walks and being patient throughout the minor leagues. And you see a lot of their young hitters come up and just not really chase out of the strike zone. Now, It's not like the lack of walks is being coupled with a lot of strikeouts, despite the Orioles being aggressive. 21.6% strikeout rate, pretty much middle of the pack. That is 13th lowest in Major League Baseball, so not an issue whatsoever on the strikeout side, which is good. And when the Orioles are making contact, and they are, they are doing damage. 43.2% hard hit rate is the third best in all of baseball this year. 
their 198 isolated power, which is essentially your slugging percentage minus your on-base percentage. So it's just what are you doing power-wise of 198 is by far the best in baseball. And they lead the league with 69 home runs coming into Tuesday as well. So here's what's happened. It hasn't been said 100% out loud, but there's clearly been at least a little shift in offensive approach as a team at the major league level where they want the Orioles to be more aggressive early in counts and hunt those pitches to hit early. Because generally across the board, the best pitch you're going to get to hit is usually early in the count and you got to go get it. And sometimes you only get one pitch to hit when you come to the plate. And the Orioles are slugging almost 700 on the first pitch. That is the best in Major League Baseball. That's why they're attacking a lot of first pitches this year. A lot of times the first pitch is the best one to hit as well. But clearly they're being more aggressive early in counts, and it's been working, right? They're doing more damage, they're hitting for more power, and they're scoring more runs. It has been good to see the Orioles work through that and be one of the best offensive. I mean, basically in every category besides walks and strikeouts, they are like top 10 across the board in Major League Baseball in every offensive category. But it is true that they are walking much less, and because of this approach, they are prone to maybe some more nights where things go completely wrong and they can be a little more silent at the plate. Now, they've only been shut out twice this year, and that's through 45 games. That's nothing to slouch at. I mean, two shutouts in 45 games, you'll take that all the time. But things are a little different when you approach it like this. And I see a lot of thoughts that it's like a plate discipline plot problem for the Orioles. I, I don't see it like that at all. The, it's not like the Orioles are chasing an insane amount. Like they're chasing out of the zone a little bit more than they did last year. That is certainly the case. You just look at the stats. That's what it says. But it's not to an egregious amount. And they're still not striking out a crazy amount. And they're still making really good contact. I would say the Orioles still have great plate discipline because what they're doing is identifying the pitches early in the count that they can hit and driving those baseballs. And it's not going to work every time. Sometimes you're going to get annoyed. Sometimes the O's are going to get an off-speed pitch in the middle of the zone on the first pitch, and they're going to be out ahead of it, and they're going to roll it over second base on the first pitch of the at-bat. You're going to be like, why are you swinging at the first pitch? Why are you not making good contact on the first pitch? If it's a breaking ball down the middle and you just got fooled a little bit, still a good swing decision to swing at a breaking ball down the middle on the first pitch. You're not going to get mad at let, Let's look at Tuesday night. Ryan O'Hearn, 0 for 3 in the game already. His final at-bat against Lance Lynn was a sinker at 90 miles an hour that was basically right down the middle on the first pitch. He just missed it a little bit and grounded out to second on the first pitch of the at-bat. You're going to get mad at Ryan O'Hearn, who is one of the best quality of contact guys in all of baseball, for swinging at a first pitch sinker right down the middle. He just missed it. Ryan O'Hearn doesn't miss it that much. He just missed it. That is a good swing decision and a good plate approach, just a bad result. And that's what happens a lot in baseball. And people always say, you know, you're a great hitter. And you get a six out of 10 times, you get a bad result. That is how Major League Baseball works. The swing decisions are still good. If you are attacking pitches that you can drive early in the count, that's still good plate discipline because you are looking for your pitch to do damage and to make hard contact. And that's what the Orioles are doing. And I think the best example of what's going on this season is Adley Rutschman. The big thing with Adley is, oh my gosh, he used to be a walk general, right? 101 strikeouts to 92 walks last season. It was ridiculous. AL leader in walks. But it was like, where does walk go? Walked at a 13% rate last year, only at 5% this year. He's barely walking this season. His on-base percentage last year was 374. It's dropped to 342 this year. But overall, statistically, Adley has been a better hitter. Not only is his average up, he's hitting over 300 on the year, but his slugging percentage is up from 435 to 492, and his OPS, on-base plus slugging, which is a better stat of kind of combining everything that you can do as a hitter, is up from 809 to 834, these stats coming into play on Tuesday. That tells you overall, Adley Rutschman, through about two months this year, has been a better hitter overall than he was throughout the entire season last year. And this is how you can kind of break it down even further. And then this isn't like a readily available stat that people use because it's kind of a silly stat to go to, but it helps to make the point here and show what we're talking about. So you see a lot of, the, of times the stats total bases that a hitter has. Those are on your hits. You know, when you get a single, you get one total base, you hit a double, two, triple, three, and home runs four. I wanted to add in also how many total bases earned is the stat I'm going to call this. So not just your hits, but also your walks and your hit by pitches. So any walks or hit by pitches is also one total base added to the total. So for Adley Rutschman in 2023, he had 350 total bases earned 
in 687 plate appearances. Coming into play Tuesday, he had 100 total bases earned. Again, that's all the hits, the walks, and the hit-by-pitches in 193 plate appearances. If you projected out that rate to, again, the equal number of plate appearances, 687, as he had last year, it would equate to 356 total bases earned. Remember, he had 350 last year, so that would put him overall at a slightly better offensive production season this year than he had last year, despite the walk rate, like Adley Rutschman's number one calling card as a hitter, going way down because the power is up. He's doing more damage. So yes, in general, he's getting on base less often for his teammates behind him, but he's doing more driving in the teammates who hit before him. He is ending up on second more often than first base. Walks are great. But if you have the ability to do damage, which Adley has done this year, and you can hit a double instead of a walk, well, you're on second instead of first, and you're more likely to drive in a run when you hit the ball in play, that helps your team more than a walk does. Walks are great, but singles are better, doubles are better, triples are better, and home runs are better. And that's what the Orioles are hunting this year. That's a very kind of easy way to put it, but that's basically what's going on with Adley Rutschman overall He's been better. And this is a really simple way to put it, but like four walks in an inning is equal to one home run in an inning. The what you get runs wise for your team. So these walks are great, but if you are hunting out damage and you get four guys in a row to walk, all you would need is a single and then a homer to outperform that run-wise in an inning. So if you're hunting to do damage, you're generally going to score more than being passive and drawing walks. We saw it with Gunnar Henderson last year. Remember, he was hitting sub-200 for the first six weeks of the season, but he was still drawing a lot of walks. His on-base percentage was in the high 300s. His walk rate was crazy high. He wasn't chasing out of the zone, but he wasn't able to get hits. And then you know, we got into June, and Gunnar Henderson was just like, you know what? I'm going to be more aggressive. His walk rate plummeted. He didn't really walk much at all in the second half of the season, but he traded that off for being much more aggressive, attacking pitches. He started to do damage, started to hit for power, and won rookie of the year last year. And we're seeing it again, where Gunner is the leader in home runs in the league and is on pace to potentially win the MVP award this season. And it's not going to work for everyone. right? It's tougher for guys who you know rely on their walks more. It's a big part of their game. But it's also like you look at a guy like Ryan Mountcastle or Austin Hayes, they weren't guys who were walking anyway. So you might as well have them be aggressive and try and hunt those pitches even more early in the count because you know just the way they play, they're going to be victims of the strikeout if they get deep into a count and they're not going to draw a lot of walks. So maybe it helps them even more. We could see that. Now, in conclusion, the Orioles still need to walk more. Like even with this approach, they need to walk more. Ryan Fuller, the Orioles co-hitting coach, said it. He told it to John Mioli, who put out the first edition of his great new newsletter at the Baltimore Banner on Tuesday, talked to Ryan Fuller about the Orioles' offensive approach, and Fuller was like, look, we need to walk more. We still need to have some more patient at-bats. And he was basically saying, our slugging is there. If we get our walks and our on-base up, then we're going to be like another level. And that's completely true, and I agree. In conclusion, the Orioles need to walk more. But I don't need them to be number five in on-base percentage, number five in walk rate. I don't want them to be 28th in walk rate. If you could get the OBP and the walk rate maybe closer to like league average, you know, 14th, 15th, 16th in baseball, and you combine it with still being top two, top three in slugging and hitting homers, that takes you to another level. It's really hard to be like top five in walks and top five in homers. Not a lot of offenses are going to do that. But if you can at the very least get the walk rate up a little bit and still be a little more patient when you need to be while still being aggressive most of the time, that's where things can come together. Like, for example, the Orioles faced George Kirby on Sunday, and they got to him. They scored five runs off one of the best starters in the American League. George Kirby is known for walking no one. He had walked only five batters coming into that start. So you know against Kirby, we got to attack early because he's not going to walk us, and their aggressive approach worked perfectly. He threw a lot of pitches in the zone. The Orioles went and got him, and they scored runs. Now, there's some pitchers who are a little more wild, and you're going to have to adjust the approach a little bit. And that's what the O's are going to need to do more. But that aggressive approach, it's working. They are scoring 4.98 runs per game this season coming into Tuesday. That's best baseball. Last year, with a little less power, a little more on base, it also scored exactly 4.98 runs per game. However, 
It was a little better run environment last year. So that 4.98 runs per game was seventh last season while it gets them fourth this year. So in general, because of the run environment, they're scoring a tad bit more versus expected this year with the different approach. And at worst, it's been kind of the same across the board. So it's hard to argue that it's hurting them. I think the reason why people think it's hurting them is because when you go with this big time, you know, big time sell out for power, swing early in the count, go get pitches, you're going to have sometimes where, as I mentioned, you're going to ground out on the first pitch. You're going to fly out on the first pitch. You're going to have innings where you make the opposing pitcher only throw seven or eight pitches and go down one, two, three. In general, in the long run, it's still going to work out in your favor, but there's going to be some frustrating innings and there's going to be some frustrating games where you're just unable to square up a pitcher who's throwing a lot in the zone and you make a lot of quick outs and all of a sudden the guy throws seven or eight scoreless on like 90 pitches. And that's unfortunate. This approach has a lower floor. Like when you are patient and draw walks, you're going to have more base runners. You're going to have more chances to score. When you are this aggressive, as I mentioned, sometimes when it doesn't work out, it's going to look worse. But this approach also has a higher ceiling. And that is what we're seeing more often than not. The Orioles hitting the most home runs in the league, having big innings, scoring runs off good pitchers, kind of blowing teams out at times, like really hitting for a lot of power. That is the trade-off here. Sometimes when a couple of games look really bad, that doesn't mean everything is really bad. It's just a product of this approach. And again, they need to walk more. They need to get that OBP up a little bit and the walk rate up a little bit. But I don't think it's going to be a giant issue because the flip side of it, the positive side, has been even better. And again, the Ozari top five offense in baseball right now. Not sure why everyone's so doom and gloom about the Orioles offense. It's been great. It's just different. And I get that people struggle with change as well. It's different. Again, the ceiling might be a little higher. The floor might be a little lower at times. And they need to get the walk rate up. But here's the big thing here. The Orioles are playing for power. They are playing for slug. And the research shows the teams that have the most playoff success are the teams that are able to hit home runs and are able to hit for power and have extra base hits in the postseason. Because in the playoffs, the pitching gets even better. It becomes harder to hit. And sometimes the best way to win is to just run into a two-run homer instead of trying to thread together hits and walks and bunts and all that stuff. It's just better to just get the big swing, hit a three-run homer, and try and hold the other team down. Research has shown the teams that hit the most homers in the playoffs generally advance the furthest. Of course, this is an Orioles team that got swept out of the playoffs last year, so maybe this adjustment will really pay off in the long run when the Orioles get to October. But I'll dive into this even more on future episodes as this season goes along. But one more couple of things to get to when we come back. Just want to talk about this kind of odd double header ish thing that the Orioles are going to play here on Wednesday in St. Louis and uh, a couple of things surrounding the decisions the O's have to make before that uh, game gets resumed this afternoon. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. So with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. So to finish things up on today's Wednesday episode, I want to get you ready. Hopefully you are listening to this or watching this uh, before the start of this kind of game and a half the O's are playing on Wednesday. But I want to get you ready for what would be a, a weird day of baseball. So here's where the situation is again. Game suspended in the middle of the sixth inning, 1-1 tie. So it will be resumed at 12.15 p.m. Eastern time here on Wednesday. It'll be the beginning of the bottom of the sixth inning. The Cardinals will have Nolan Arenado, Alec Burleson, uh, their catcher Herrera and then Nolan Gorman is the first four due up in the bottom of the sixth. Of course, Kyle Bradish will be done after five innings for the Orioles. Lance Lynn, the Cardinal starter, will be done after six innings. It'll be bullpens from there on out 
in the conclusion of this suspended game. Now, for the Orioles, I would think most likely, not definite, but we could see Cole Irvin just take the mound to kind of quote unquote start the suspended game. He threw two good innings on Sunday. He's had two full days of rest. And he could be a guy who you throw out there knowing that you have another nine inning game to play. And at the very least, he can pitch, you know, the sixth and seventh for you, turn it over to the bullpen. Maybe he can pitch you the sixth, seventh, and the eighth. You get the lead. You turn it over to a back end guy to close it out in the ninth. That would be the perfect scenario. But you got, you know, righty, lefty, righty, lefty coming up. So some matchups, at least the Cole Irvin can exploit. This seems like a good time to use Irvin if you're going to use him out of the bullpen when you have kind of this half double header coming up. Now, the Orioles could certainly go to a different reliever. You know, Craig Kimbrell's fairly well rested and Yin Cano is fairly well rested. So they could go to one of those guys. But I have a feeling Cole Irvin is going to kind of start this suspended game on Wednesday. And then, you know, you can make lineup changes. You can put different guys in relief in. Um, you just you're just continuing the game. You always haven't done it yet this year, but you're just continuing the game right from where you left off. Then it seems like we'll have like a 30 to 45 minute break ish, maybe an hour long break at most once this first game ends. And then they will start the originally scheduled game for Wednesday, the final game of the series. It is going to be John Means against our old friend Kyle Gibson, who is going to go for the Cardinals. I would think for St. Louis, they'll probably just go to their regular relievers once they get to the seventh inning out there. But It'll be interesting to see Kyle Gibson back out there. So far for Gibson in a Cardinal uniform after signing that one-year contract, 4.09 ERA for Gibby in nine starts. His last time out, six innings, five earned runs allowed against the Red Sox. There were some good quotes from him, from Orioles players, from Brandon Hyde about just how much he meant to the Orioles when he was with the team last year. Put up a, a funny sign in the dugout saying no hoses allowed in here when the O's got there on Monday, and uh, there was like 10-plus Orioles surrounding Kyle Gibson during BP on Monday. The guys absolutely loved his time with the Orioles. Let's just hope he doesn't have a good start against his old team on Wednesday. But the other thing you do get to do in these suspended games is, although it's not a full doubleheader, right, it's the presumably the final four innings of one game and then another game, you still get to call up that 27th man. For a doubleheader, you get his 27th player who you can call up. You don't have to burn one of their options of the year, one of their five options of the year to do it. And then generally a team will just send them right back down after the doubleheader is over. Now the rules state that you can use a 27th man for the suspended game. The only difference is in a regular doubleheader, you can call up that 27th man. You can use them whenever. In a suspended game, you can only use the 27th man in the full baseball game. So whoever the O's call up, and they'll most likely call up a pitcher, they can't use him in the first game. They can't use him in the suspended game, but once they get to the actual fresh game, the nine inning game, then they can use that extra arm. Really, there are four options for the Orioles to go to with that spot. Uh, a couple guys who could have been options, Bruce Zimmerman is on the injured list in Norfolk right now, and Jonathan Heasley, who's been pitching lights out for the Tides, 20 innings and one earned run allowed in Norfolk. He just started and threw five innings on Sunday, so he would not be available to pitch, so he will not be one of the guys as well. So looking at the players already on the 40-man roster, I came up with four guys who could come up. Nick Vespi would be the first one, 3-2-2 ERA and 22 innings in Norfolk. He did throw 28 pitches out of the Tides bullpen on Sunday, but that does give him two full days of rest Monday and Tuesday. He's been given the Tides length like two innings at a time, which is good. I think he would be at least ready to give an inning for the Orioles and be called up. Lefty Matt Crook could be another option. He hasn't been called up to the big leagues yet this year, but had been in the bigs with the Yankees last year. Has a 1-8 ERA in 15 innings. He threw 13 pitches on Sunday and then had two days off, so he'll be fine and ready to go. Corbin Martin, who was just recently claimed the right-hander off waivers by the Orioles from the Brewers. He's only pitched in a couple of games in AAA. He threw 16 pitches on Sunday. Again, could be an option that can give you length as well. And the last guy would be bringing Dylan Tate back. Certainly a possibility. Hasn't pitched a lot lately. Orioles are kind of working on some things with him, but he did throw 10 pitches in that Sunday game for Norfolk. So again, two days of rest. He would be fully ready to go. Orioles actually kind of lucky. The Tides played a game Tuesday in which they lost 20 to four, but they didn't use that that many pitchers in a game when they gave up 20 runs. Shout out to uh, Ryan Higgins, who was up with AAA Norfolk and was a position player pitcher who actually recorded four outs at the end of the game, which was helpful as well. So shout out to Ryan Higgins. But uh, yeah, they didn't use a lot of their best relievers on Tuesday. They did use Brian Baker 
Now, he's been terrible in AAA this year, but he is on the 40-man roster, would have been an option. But because he pitched Tuesday, the O's probably wouldn't go to him either. So I'd say Vespi, Crook, Martin, or Tate. And just from you know who the Oros trust amongst these guys, if I had to rank them from most to least likely, I'd say Nick Vespi, number one, Dylan Tate, number two, then probably Matt Crook, number three, and Corbin Martin, number four. But uh, those are your options for who could come up and uh, help the O's in that second game Wednesday. And then that player would most likely just be optioned back to AAA after these two games. But either way, I will be back with you tomorrow. and We'll recap a game and a half of baseball, let you know what happened at the end of the suspended game, and then what happened in the full baseball game. The Orioles kind of right now, I guess, still technically the, the sweepless streak is in jeopardy. And you would think they'll win at least one of these two games to keep it out of the way. And hopefully... We'll uh, be talking about a series win when I come back tomorrow. I'll recap both games. And then we'll do a little retrospective because coming up tomorrow is my 1,000th episode hosting the Locked on Orioles podcast. I'll kind of talk about the 1,000 episodes so far, what it's meant, what it's uh, what it's been, and what it will be this podcast moving forward. That's coming up on tomorrow's episode. Until then, make sure to leave a five-star rating and a review wherever you listen. And make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube channel. We are so, so close to 7,000 subscribers. Going to do a cool giveaway when we get there, but you got to be subscribed to enter, so make sure you subscribe. It'll be kind of all around this 1,000th episode celebration, which will be tomorrow on the show. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.